Hey, everybody, you're listening and watching the Comic Book Bears podcast. I'm Bill Zanowitz. I'm Brian Pittard. I'm Steve Mori. And I'm Caleb Alexander McKenzie. And we are your hairy, heavy homos that talk about comic books, but you don't have to be a hairy, heavy homo to listen in or watch. But it helps. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, what do you have to yeah, lose? No, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> what do you got to lose? Mm. Um, so this is our first Facebook Live event. Uh, we're keeping it very loose because if we were worried about, you know, structure, we'll we'll, we'll batten that down in the audio version. It'll be very neat <laughs> when that's released. And um, something that we're not doing on the Facebook stream, that, but that happened earlier tonight and which will be part of our next episode is we did have an interview with Cliff Meth. Cliff is uh, best known for being a co-publisher of, of um, <clears throat> Artwork Publishing. Uh, being a co-publisher of Artwork Publishing. I'm repeating myself deliberately just so for the audio version, it's more clear. Uh, the author of comic book Babylon, very connected with the Dave Cockrum estate. And you'll hear all about that in the interview segment. That's going to happen right now. Just like the movie bears. And we're back. <laughs> and thank you again, Cliff, for that interview. And uh, we will be posting links and uh, all that sort of stuff so that you can uh, contact Cliff, if uh, you want to sample some of his work or purchase some books through the uh, through the Dave Cockrum Estate, uh, which does in part benefit scholarships at the Kubert School. Uh, so we're going to start off uh, this segment of the show with some news. And um, when we were talking about the news before, uh, one of my co-hosts seemed fairly upset that I was dismissive of one particular bit of news. But one bit of news that I was not dismissive about was the seismic development that DC has cut their ties with Diamond distrib Distribution and are now being distributed solely through the startup publish, uh, <coughs> sorry, startup distributors that uh, uh, popped up during uh, the time that Diamond was shut down. Uh, and again, those are uh, Lunar and UCS. Uh, their books are also, um, at least in the trade and hardcover uh, market, are also being distributed by Penguin Random House. Um, and that sent some shockwaves through the industry. And who better to tell you about that is our own Steve Morey. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> uh, well, so, you know, this is this is obviously a really big thing. And one thing that you had mentioned a little bit earlier in uh, a discarded take, so to speak, um, is that we don't really know how long this has been in the works or how, you know, what was happening behind the scenes. Obviously, there's probably a lot of legal wrangling that have been happening. There's probably been a lot of negotiations that have been happening. Um, I think someone uh, had mentioned in uh, an article I've read that uh, this is something that DC has been kind of looking at since at least last year, opening up their distribution channels uh, instead of going through just Diamond, trying to see what else is out there uh, to get their books out. Um, but obviously, you know, this is huge that DC completely broke with uh, Diamond and Diamond, of course, uh, you know, made that split very quick as well. There will be no more DC previews. There'll be no more DC section featured in, the, in uh, their catalog, uh, in the previous catalog. So, you know, now if stores want to order, they have to go through um, UCS or Lunar. And obviously there's a couple other order cutoff time, uh, order cutoff dates. Uh, they can have earlier on sell, uh, on sale dates. Now it's on Tuesdays instead of Wednesdays for uh, the DC books released that week. Um, there was another thing I, I was speaking with my with the owner of the uh, of the LCS, um, and two things that he brought up. One was kind of a negative, and that's um, a lot of uh, retailers actually use Diamond um, point of sale systems, mm -hmm. um, or using software that Diamond supports. If you've got a whole list of barcodes now for all these DC titles that have to be manually loaded in. Uh, every Monday night, Tuesday night, whenever you're getting the books, it's making it a little bit harder for retailers to actually do their pretty standard job rather than just getting the automatic updates uh, that Diamond provides. Um, hopefully there'll be some workarounds about this, but probably it'll end up having to be like a spreadsheet that they upload every week 
um, just something something else they have to do. Also, you know, other than filling out now two or three different order forms uh, for comics. Um, but they did mention, you know, one of the things that uh, that Diamond hasn't really done in the past 25 years, because they've been basically the only game in town, is wine and dine and try to get uh, retailers to, you know, to to incentivize them to use Diamond. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Bill, you, you've mentioned that uh, now it's based around volumes. And it, and it is, you know, if you're the only game in town, um, the only thing you can do is try and get your stores to buy more from you because, well, right. you're not going to get any new customers. Um, you know, you are you just need those customers to, to order more. Um, right, and, and again, that's... you know, that, that focuses on various areas, whether it be uh, eligibility for variant covers or for more more importantly discounts mm -hmm. on and, and that's and that can be difficult for some store owners out there especially smaller um smaller stores smaller lcs's that may not have a huge customer base but are you know they're not going to be able to, to order the hundreds of issues they're going to need to the hundreds of copies in order to get that one variant or that special store exclusive that somebody like a um you know uh, like a bigger uh, Forbidden Planet could possibly get. You know, there's not, there's not going to be any of those. Uh, that'll be very helpful for a smaller store. Now that you've got two other distributors here, and and again, right now it's still early, so the only thing that Lunar and UCS are doing, which yes, was 33% of what Diamond's monthly sales were, was DC. So now UCS and Lunar have those, but essentially. Now, they weren't five weeks ago, but now they more or less could be competing distributors. I mean, before it was set up around geography. Now, do stores still need to be limited by their geography if you're on? No, here? no, no. That's yeah. been uh, made clear in interviews and, and uh, that they can choose either UCS mm -hmm. or um, <clears throat> or Lunar uh, before yeah. it was dependent upon. They, would, they basically mm -hmm. split the country in half. Yeah. Um, but in terms of, of, of that, um, that particular issue, um, another big concern has been the international issue. Yeah. 15% um, of DC's, DC's periodical sales are from overseas. Mm -hmm. um, Caleb, are you, you're pretty well versed in that situation, mm -hmm. right? At least from our conversations. So yeah, if you want fairly. Um, so right now, uh, it, it looks like Lunar has got shipping to Australia figured out, and they're going to be able to offer it at a fairly even rate, uh, comparable to what it was before. They have not gotten UK uh, worked out or other areas yeah. of the world, but they're working on it. And I think I think one thing to remember is this has been uh, now um, existent for an entirety of twelve whole days. Um, it's a very new, and, and I see a lot of people decrying the move. And mm -hmm. when they pull up, uh, you know, what the system looks like now, well, this isn't that. This isn't what we hope. It's it's existed for twelve days. You you can't you can't un uh, unwork. I'm going to try to not use big boy language. You can't unwork um, thirty years of bottlenecking an industry in twelve days. It's going to take mm -hmm. a little bit of time. Um, but one, Bill, one thing that you said as far as shipping anywhere goes, it's not just that they can use uh, Lunar or um, what's the other uh, you, UCS. UCS. Yeah, UCS. They can actually use both of them right now, plus mm -hmm. Penguin Random House. And so, what that's going to allow these these smaller shops to do <coughs> is compare and contrast shipping rates, time, uh, productivity, and and for the or they can use Diamond for everything else and. For the first time ever, people are going to be able to demand a certain level of quality that they haven't been had reason to demand before, or they haven't been able to demand before, mm -hmm. or at least not for a long time. Yeah, for almost three decades now. I mean, yeah. it, it's been a while. So, I don't want to. I don't want to diminish when we talk about this. There, there are local comic shop owners and there are people who have very serious concerns and I don't mean to diminish those whatsoever because this is their livelihood. It's how they feed their families. Um, I don't, I don't mean to diminish that whatsoever, but I also think a lot of the concerns that I'm hearing are temporary. Uh, they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're by necessity going to be worked out within the first quarter, first, first half 
of the next year to see what things go up and running. And and they may work, they may not, they may fall on its face. But, um, you know, Brian, you mentioned people are worried about figuring out a new operating system. Um, that That's going to be a, a hiccup, I think. Or I think it was Steve that mentioned that. Mate, somebody did. Um, just sorry, it from Brian's face, alike. I'm pretty sure it was Steve. <laughs> <laughs> yes, some, somebody said it. Um, that, that's Some guy with glasses. Difficult. You're going to have to to figure out new things. Change is going to happen. Um, but necessity is the mother of invention, number one. And so I do believe, firmly believe, that new systems are going to pop up that integrate what they were doing. And these these companies are being they they were brought to life by two two of the most innovative groups in reta- in comics retailers who who have worked under Diamond. For the entire time that they've existed, they mm-hmm. know the problems that Diamond has. Like they that they were literally their problems, and they're going to be able to bring something new to the table. I know with Lunar, they're already working with a few different web developers to get mm-hmm. something new out into the world. Um, so it's gonna be it's gonna be a change, but I, I think largely it's it's a fear of change that's been holding and and holding a lot of people back and scaring a lot of people. Yeah. It's a very peculiar uh, aspect of the industry in that almost any other small business is used to dealing with multiple suppliers. Mm-hmm. Almost any other small business, they, they, if you're if you're um, if you're a nursery, you don't get your pots from the same place you get your seeds. And you know, there's a hell of a lot more competition, I imagine, and a hell of a lot more variety. Uh, open to them than it would be in the comic industry but i do think that i I can't i wouldn't use a word as uh that has such negative connotations as complacency um but i i understand that there are retailers that have become so used to something that any disruption is uh, is huge but that's uh I'll, i'll throw a personal anecdote um I was very close. We had a falling out, but I was very close to somebody that that owned a comic store, mm-hmm. and he was remarkably savvy about his shop. He was remarkably savvy about using Archie's newsstand distribution instead of through Diamond because it was cheaper for him and because mm-hmm. the return policies were better. There were times that he actually purchased books through Amazon because he got a better price uh, from that. If uh, if you know, because again, there are sellers that have. There are Amazon components that uh, the consumer is not open to that, you know, sometimes they're, they effectively are a distributor in certain contexts and uh, was able to get four or five trades for the price of what would have been for 10 trades um, over a diamond. Um, so I do think that some of these retailers are going to have to become a bit more savvy mm-hmm. about how things are going to be progressing. And, but like you said, Caleb, like, you know, we're in the infancy stages of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What did surprise me is I thought that there would be a a twilight period for Diamond. I thought DC was going to say, okay, we're going to distribute through these three entities, including Diamond, and let that sunset a little bit. And then behind the scenes, get the international worked out. Um, I know the UK has a particular pro- issue because uh, because Diamond actually had a hub close to Manchester Airport, uh, which was remarkably beneficial for uh, for the British stores. Um, I'm hoping that there is something. Uh, and again, you know, I know Caleb, we're referring to the same interview. I think yeah. you know the, the, that whether it's a consortium of stores ordering mm-hmm. together. Uh, you know, I'm sure something will be worked out. I, how ideal it is, I don't know. Um, but I do think that this is a, a situation where there, because I do think there are remarkably savvy retailers, mm-hmm. and you know that probably the most savviest retailers were prepared for something like this. Mm-hmm. Um, it was, I think, it should have always been in the back of somebody's mind, and I also think that because. Um, it's middle-aged men, <laughs> primarily. You know, they also remember what a horror story the downfall of Heroes World was, mm-hmm. uh, which was the distributor that Marvel eventually owned, and everything from Marvel went through that. Um, so, I can understand being gun shy on yeah, that particular absolutely. change. Yeah. yeah. Well, again, like, like I said, not to diminish those fears at all, because I I know what it's like to you know be a con- you know I worked as a contract worker for years and I know what it's like to not know when that next contract's coming through 
and not know where your business is going. Um, and I, I know that fear. And so it doesn't belittle that, like, not, I don't, I didn't mean to belittle that at all. Um, no, but I, I do, don't think you did. Yeah. I, I do think that this industry specifically the direct market, I'm not talking about comics at large. Cause when you talk about the industry of comics, you're talking about a $2 billion industry. When you're talking about the direct market, you're talking about something much smaller that actually takes up a significant less space of the industry at large. Um, and, and I think part of that is specifically because of the chokehold that Diamond has had on the industry for years, and there hasn't been much innovation in that at all. Mm -hmm. And Bill, like, look at their uh, website. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like you said, you're you know savvy savvy people in this industry should have been keeping this in the back of their mind, and it turns out that they were um, because that's who this is. And I know a lot of I, I've seen it from my local comic shop owner. A lot of people are decrying the fact that these are co-owned by. DCBS and Midtown, but Diamond, Diamond started yeah, as Jeppy, that. Jeppy was yeah. a retailer, so I mean, like yeah. that is that to me is asinine, and and yeah. and they they decry that because the you know the the Merklers and who and and the owners of, of Midtown have made a lot of money. They're very rich people. They own very big shops, and they're able to give out insane insane discounts that local comic shops can't mm -hmm. give out. But you know who their distributor was when they when they got that deal that allowed them to give forty percent off? It was Diamond. Diamond, yeah. Diamond allowed that to happen, and those comic shops, those local comic shops, they they they, they couldn't go anywhere. They had nothing, nothing. They they had no leg to stand on. They there was no competitor, and yeah. so if they can give because, like you said, Bill, everything revolves around volume when you've only got one distributor, and that distributor can give massive discounts they can pick and choose prices per shop based mm -hmm. on how much volume they're getting that incentivizes people to work with them and it mm -hmm. it benefits larger volume shops when it doesn't benefit smaller smaller volume shops and it allows the dcbs's the mycomicshop.coms the midtown comics the mile high comics to mm -hmm. get extremely wealthy because of who they are and the amount of people mm -hmm. that they're around when it has choked down those smaller shops. So do, mm -hmm. to decry it, because it's those people who are now giving you an option, giving you the, the avenue for comp, I sound like a capitalist, but I'm, I'm not, uh, but who are giving you the option of, of finally saying, no, if you can't give us a competitive price to what you're giving that shop based on volume, we can go with them. Mm -hmm. Flat out, mm -hmm. we will. We will go with them, and we'll give you nothing. Um, because DC gave... At least Lunar, I'm assuming they gave UCS, gave them the same bargain, the, the same deal that they had had with Diamond. So you're going to get at first the same price. Um, now they're they're working with their shipping companies to get better shipping and to negotiate that so they can try to save, cut off some of that extra fat that's going to happen because you now have two shipments. And again, they're 12, 12 days old. This this baby ain't walking yet, uh, but it, it's going to crawl for a little bit. Um, it just like that to me, and again, I'm, I'm probably stepping on some toes here and on some level, I just, I, I don't really care, but I, I do, I'm trying to be sensitive to the fears of people. Um, comic shops had the same opportunity to take innovative steps that mm -hmm. every other comic shop did. And they didn't because a lot of shop owners, number one, they're not, they're, they're just fans. Um, yeah. they're, they're just fans mm -hmm. who wanted to do this and they want to come in, they want to turn their lights on, they want to push a button and they want to go home at the end of the day. And that's cool. Yeah. Totally cool. Yeah. But your industry has been choked down to where the highest selling comic on any given month maybe sells 170,000 copies. You know what's selling like gangbusters? Graphic novels and people outside of the comic industry. Mm -hmm. Webtoons. But it's not like digital aside. Those books that Bill spoke about last week, those DC graphic novels for kids, selling like hotcakes. I forget what the exact numbers, but I looked them up the other day and like outside of the industry... Yeah, they're they're flying off shelves. People are, are living them. They're 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 digging the hell out of them because they can find them. They're accessible and they're being catered to to people that that want them um, in places that they can get them and not feel guilty about it. Um, you know, I, I'm very fortunate. I, I I could very easily use DCBS. I know a lot of you guys do. I go to my local comic shop. I pay a little bit more because I like the service. I I like the community that it builds. Um, yeah. I'm a gay man, like surprise, shocker. Um, but I walk what? into a comic shop. I, I can walk into my comic shop in Central Arkansas, and I who, can be around people who know 
I'm a gay man who know I know my husband, am treated with respect. There are people of all genders and color uh, in there, and we can have an amazing dialogue, great conversation. That is not the experience that a lot of people get when they walk into comic shops. Mm-hmm. And so I I've absolutely rarely had that. Yeah. Yeah, I've really had that. It's, it's I had great. it for a short window when I developed friendships with people that worked at one particular store, but I've rarely had that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and just the way that, it worked out. Yeah. Well, and, and part of that is because the industry's choked down to superheroes for 30 years since the early 90s, late 80s. It was superheroes or nothing else. Superheroes yeah. are very attractive to a particular, you know, white boy um, for a long time, or at least males. Uh, you know, even beyond, uh, you know, what, what people, where, where you come from. Um, but mm-hmm. that is, that has pushed a lot of people out and disinterested a lot of people and graphic novels, the book market is putting it back in their hands. And part of me wonders, and I, I have no idea, like I've seen the rumor mill run on this, but it's been mostly people pontificating and stuff. Um, part of me wonders if the sudden drop of diamond by DC has got something to do like like the room the, the word on the street <laughs> rumor mill stuff mm-hmm. is that Solvency, diamond yeah. tr- diamond tried to get salty and tried to push in on their book distribution uh, that they had planning and were working with um, uh, oh the other yeah, yeah. Um, and so they took the opportunity and said no not like you're we're like we'll go and, and they did and so there there's something behind the scenes here that that caused the massive disruption and caused them to instantaneously say we are no longer interested in, in your business not that even we we don't even want to shake hands with you we're not going to see if this other avenue works um and, and they dropped them and well i see that rep- I, I see that representation but i also think there is that you know that idiotic element to the comic book fandom of uh that oh, everything sure. is is is, is a, a marvel versus dc essentially fight right you know? and i'm not even saying i'm i'm saying that in uh it has nothing to do with the companies that it's retailers versus diamond that it's retailers versus the customer mm-hmm. you know it, it's very um it's very black and white mm-hmm. um and the minute you read an actual article about the business you, you know that's out the door um one thing I do have to say is the parties that are involved, including Jeppy and Diamond, mm-hmm. including the publishers, maybe not necessarily the bigger publishers, because let's, uh, I'm sure that there are people at AT and T and Disney that view these entities as R and D and nothing else. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I'm sure there are people there. I don't think it's everybody, but um, I'm sure that there. Are, that there is some IP there. Mind. but That's in terms of jeppy and diamond and the people behind the distributors and the majority of people at publishers nobody wants the industry to fail no there's, there's nobody no, that wants the industry to fail there's and no comic book some book. of the some of that speculation almost comes from that yeah nonsense black and white area um brian Please interject. <laughs> You've got to have been cock blocked here. So. No, I have nothing to add because I have largely really? taken myself out of the ecosystem by doing digital only now. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. to me, as much as it's, you know, I have friends who own LCSs and I'm certainly aware of the culture having spent many years, you know, as part of it. Now I'm just kind of like, I, I'm not going to say let it burn, but because obviously I care about the industry and I care about the direct market in some form, but. I'm all for anything that takes it out of that space and puts it in the hands of anybody else who wants to get into stories told sequentially. That's what matters yeah. where yeah. it's told, where it's sold. It, it doesn't matter as much to me long-term as the health of sequential storytelling as a medium. So the artists and the writers being able to, to find those outlets, to tell their stories, to get them in the hands of people who want to read them. Yeah. No. Uh, it, it, you know, with, uh, with the whole diamond thing, I mean, you know, we're talking about distribution. Mm-hmm. If as long as stores are able to get their comics, you know, I, I could care less who, or I couldn't care less who they're getting them from. Yeah, no. Right. How many industries do the people who patronize that industry know all the minutiae about the the distribution models? Like 
Nick, Fun. comics are special in that way because I, people in our age group and or, you know, whatever, who are traditionally the uh, patrons of the direct market, mm-hmm. we're the ones who are like in on the, the intrigue and and because there's so few players that are like, you mm-hmm. know, the, the, well, especially before, you know, recently, but, you know, the, 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 the relative few number of comic book publishers and distribution sources now, even if it's like three or four compared to one. Like, it's just so boutique, and I think that's what's <laughs> held back comics mm-hmm. and sequential yeah. storytelling for decades. But, I mean, I understand the history enough to know it was necessary, the way Marvel, you know, and, and then later, you know, Heroes World Diamond, all that. Like, I know I know the history of how that came together, and I know why it saved the industry. But mm-hmm. in saving the industry, maybe you're not helping the medium, you know? Yeah. And also, we're not we're not where we were. Like the industry itself, and the distribution model, and the where where stores were, they're very different. It's very different from twenty five years ago. I mean, people aren't doing it. There's there's one. There's an internet now uh, that people are placing all of their orders on. You know, you're not sitting there with multiple order forms, paper forms that you need to get in the mail or fax somewhere. You could just go online and I just... I swear, though, there's stores out there that would not shock me. I know one in Newport, <laughs> Rhode Island, Annex Comics. Oh, my God. Every time I would go to that LCS, I'd be like, you're still in business. And, like, it's just, <laughs> like, chaos from 30 years ago and paper this and all this. I'm sure he uses the internet. I know he does. The guy actually has quite an eBay business. That's what I'm seeing. Actually, my LCS in Orlando, uh, run by Aaron Holland, uh, a comic shop, he told me, I don't think it was in confidence, that he's honestly more invested now in his eBay business mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. side of things than his LCS, the, the brick and mortar. Like, he's keeping it alive. And, God, if you want to go on Bleeding Cool and see about how he kept that business afloat during the last couple months, it's remarkable what he would do. But it's it's mm-hmm. all through innovating. It's all through online sales and so much less through direct yeah. but i mean you know that all still relies on a distribution chain and all this other stuff so yeah, well, yeah. It, i mean what, one of the most shocking things i think because I, I know caleb and i listened to the same podcast interview there are still uh that there are still retailers that operate with diamond on cod yeah that yeah. blew my mind and some of them they are keeping on cod when they don't need to be yeah <laughs> that blew my well, mind I, again you have no you have no leverage yeah, that, like you are wasting your money, and for a market that is becoming and kind of to mix what we're the two things that we're talking about, those kind of comic shops are becoming a nostalgia market. Mm-hmm. The like the new books, like you know, because I've heard the guy who runs my comic shop talk about it. He hasn't done it yet, but he's like, I, you know, I just I'll quit getting new comics. I'll sell back issues, and you know, I'll sell my eBay stores, and I'll, I'll go into you know classic toys and this that and the other because there's a huge market for that, but. At some point, that market l- literally passes on, um, yeah. and, and so and that's that is a big problem with the way that this the direct market works is because they are not going out and grabbing new customers because new co- mm-hmm. like the, worked in a comic shop for a short time the number of people that would come in all the time oh they still make these I never knew this place was here well we we've been here for ten years you drive down the street every day. Be- and that's why pe- when you know comics are going into Walmart or you know Bill finds Archie comics at the grocery store and stuff like that, like people see those and they get them as <laughs> as, as kind of impulse buys. That's how a lot of us started buying comics. Yeah, spinner rack, adults. Maybe. Yeah, sadly, mom- sadly, I could not provide a new Archie comics oh, digest. I was expecting <gasps> it to come yeah. up from your hand. I saw you lean the, over the, and I was the, like, oh, the DCBS oh, box came on. Monday and the digest era for Bill Zanowitz yeah. may be over. Aww. My DCBS came too, so yeah. So DC comics, we so. have a comment I want to share. We've actually oh. had some some uh, people saying hi, but uh, oh, tell us who. Uh, we, oh, Jim, Pol- uh, I can never say his name. Poliafico. Yeah, Poliafico. Yeah, thank you. For, and, and Brad from uh, Movie Bears. Uh, yeah. A couple uh, also, uh, everybody wish Jim a happy birthday. It was his oh. birthday this week. So happy, happy birthday. birthday. Happy Jim. birthday, Jim. Uh, but yeah. uh, we did have a comment from Arnie uh, Razorfish. I don't know if anyone yeah. knows yes. Arnie. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we, we know him. Okay, good. He's the Razorfish that. part is new. but oh, yeah. okay. So his comment was, no industry should bend to the participants that won't continue to enhance and upgrade their model. We discontinued paper products at my day job because the juice wasn't worth the squeeze. So, yeah, yeah. Mm, more good of way that, of putting right? it. Very good way yeah. of putting it. He's um, a he's an incredibly smart man. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, you know, and I, if uh, if you recall, um, if anybody who's, who's watching or listening, uh, a couple months ago, I talked about my comic shop country, which was mm-hmm. uh, a great documentary that was put out. Um, it was true labor of love for the filmmaker um, that took several years to make. But one of the the big cruxes of the thesis on that is that comic shops are 100 percent tied to the people who run them. <sighs> And if the people who run them don't want to change, uh, don't have the, you know, and a lot of them aren't business people. They are fans. I mean, Kayla, you said it, like they're fans who happen to, you know, find a storefront and start selling stuff. Um, you know, if, if they don't understand how the business model would benefit them, if they paid more attention, took a couple courses about things, um, you know, looked at the different opportunities that they have to innovate, innovate, and attract new people and change how they order and you know upgrade their stores and update their stores um you know that that's not going to last for them if these the stores parents, are going to are going to die if the parents don't have a reason to walk into the comic shop then the kids mm-hmm. aren't getting comics which means that you are not raising a new generation of people who are going to buy comics tomorrow yeah flat out you're, you're done if you are not getting outside of the four walls of your shop and advertising and getting people to walk into your store trying to attract new customers, then what you're essentially doing is you are selling to a dwindling, ever dwindling comic space, and you're like, like that is not a that's not a sustainable model. That is that that's literally why Batman only sells 170 thousand copies on a good week. Yeah, I'm gonna shut up because I got in trouble. <gasps> well, uh, you know and. and... <laughs> <laughs> kind of go, kind of go along with that too. I mean, yeah. if you, <laughs> if as a store up. owner, or as a major, as a major voice in the direct market, if your biggest complaint is now, you know, oh, I have to deal with, I have to deal with this, I have to deal with yet another, another distributor or whatnot. What would what we say about, you know, Brian said it best. It's like no other business, no other industry, is so. You know, it, the do the people who purchase or the people who consume it are so interested in the minutia of it. I do not go into my local Harris Teeter and know where they got uh, the Campbell soup versus the other soups. Um, and and you know, it's just yeah, but there's so um, much. There also is a breed of comic fan that does not care about this. They oh, just want to make sure that they get the books. They're, 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 and then there's other people that are like, they're losing sleep over it. <laughs> true. Oh, very true. Um, and, you know, and if a store owner... We've just talked about it for 31 account. minutes. So. Yeah, exactly. There's got to be a store, like store owners that are successful are the ones that do what they can to get the books in the hands of the people that want them and get the books in the hands of the people that they want to read the books. You know, they want to attract new people. They want to, you know, whatever. And having multiple distributors and saying, well, I can't do this. I can't deal with, you know, three different distributors now or two separate distributors for this because it's going to just ruin me. That's not thinking inside the box because months ago, the issue was Diamond keeps destroying my books. I can't order enough to get an incentive. Blah, blah, blah. Like there's, yeah. you know. Some of the same people complaining about Diamond are complaining about this development. Exactly. Yeah. Sorry, you're there's yeah. no incentive for Diamond to improve. Yeah. If they're the only game in town. Can I say something that gets me in trouble? Sure. Um we've had a lot of talk here about um attracting new people, and that always comes down to kids. Mm-hmm. And for a long time I felt kids were a lost cause. I really do. I honestly do. Um because I think they are better served in terms, at least in terms of superheroes. Let me put it, let me provide that caveat. But I think at least in terms of superheroes, I think they are better served an introduction to these characters through animation and through video games. I don't think the periodical necessarily works for them. If I were somebody uh, that was professionally involved in obtaining a new audience i go after the 28 year old guy who gobbles up every mcu movie but has never bought a comic book what's preventing that guy from becoming a monthly reader you know oh oh, you know endgame is endgame it's like no it's every month dude (laughs) there's at least three avengers books every freaking month well or Um, the the college or the college students you know men women and be you know those college students who streamline every season of Shira 
on Netflix. Love it. And here's um, Noel Stevenson's been writing some amazing stuff that you can mm-hmm. get at your local comic shop. Yeah. Introduce yeah. that. You it's, know, yeah. So I, the way you said it. to so, me, like I think yeah. there should be more concentration on the acquisition of new people from that manner instead of mm-hmm. the uh, instead of the eight year old kid. You know, they're not going to come into the industry through the friggin' IDW books. So they're just in, not in Orlando yeah. at, again. A comic shop. One of the best ways they got new people in the door is when they opened the bar called the Geek Easy, and it was adjacent. <laughs> in fact, it was originally one. I think uh, Bill, you went there with me, right? Did yeah, you go? yeah. The... I, and I've seen it. Yeah. 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 So I, like, I never got to go in when it was open. But oh, that's right. It, it was one building, and you would go to the comic shop, and then you would go past through the door into a bar with video games, and and they had live entertainment and all this stuff. And I saw so many people going in and out, passing through the comic section, and then picking up books. So, and then they got into it, and they became re- return customers, and mm-hmm. so. I feel like it's we we wall off these places in sh- in strip malls and and a lot of stores are doing this. So I'm not saying a comic shop was the exception, but I still think it's not the rule that stores are innovating in ways to bring new people in, whether they're 28 year olds or eight year olds. Like free mm-hmm. comic book day is great, and a lot of foot traffic and a lot of families come through, but I don't see that necessarily even like return uh, customers mm-hmm. as much from uh, those kids that come through. So. I, and they're expensive. Comics are comics well, are pricey. They're expensive, and people don't want hmm. stuff. I really do. As much as I am now, you know, drinking my own Kool Aid here, I I do believe that people, present company excluded, ecto cooler, yeah, only ecto cooler, yeah. uh, present company. I'm 100 percent excluding you guys. We we want oh we want our entertainment presented to us very downloadable, digital, digitally streaming. Yeah. So the, the, the fact that you have to go to a place, and especially when something like a pandemic happens, but that's some special place, right? <laughs> yeah. But when you have to yeah. go to a special place, yeah, it's a neat experience. And some of us are really – I still love that experience. But a lot of the new uh, people who want to get into this, it's, it's a barrier to entry. And yeah. we should be all about breaking yeah. down these barriers and letting everybody experience sequential storytelling. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Anyway. Uh, yeah. We have another uh, person who just joined us, Peter Lovins. Who, hey, Peter. Hey, how you doing? Uh, I figured you guys probably know him. I, I'm terrible. I don't know these people. I'm so he's he's um he's Mike Levin's partner. Oh, uh, husband. Oh. Uh, yeah. okay, I knew the name yeah. was like in my head. Anyway, yeah. So yeah, uh, we've got a few people hanging out in the chat. Uh, no other uh, exciting comments, but uh, uh, I'm sure <laughs> that no exciting comments. Well, well, they'll they'll be they'll rise to the occasion here uh, shortly. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, before we go further, something we haven't done. We have generally been showing off our shirts. Uh, so uh, let's go. I have the cyborg um, cyber spin. Nice. That's oh, the yeah. attraction at uh, at uh, Six Flags Great Adventure. Um, oh, nice. It it'll make you throw up, uh, <laughs> but the shirt's really cool. <laughs> okay. so what I've, do you got, Steve? Oh, oh, oh or, no, Brian. Go let's go, Brian yeah. first. Let's go, Brian. So uh, in honor of Chaz, which if you're not following the news, uh, how could you not? <laughs> Seattle has the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone, where the protesters have uh, basically taken over, and it's like Occupy Capitol Hill. But anyway, ah, <laughs> I haven't been down to Chaz yet, but I uh, had to wear something to uh, honor the uh, the struggle. So uh, you know, wherever, wherever that is there. Hey, Seattle. <laughs> um, I have uh, basically sort of a a mashup, Totoro in the uh, style of Godzilla. <laughs> um, really cool. Um, I, I I love this shirt, and so does my niece. So you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually get to play this week. I haven't got to play the last few weeks. I yeah. ah nice. And we wearing... I, I got to get that for my husband because that's exactly up his alley. That flex? Yeah. I... Huh? Wh- who makes that shirt? Out geeks. Oh, out geeks. Okay. Out geeks. Yes. Out geeks. Um, okay, so Steve. I... What's going on with Batwoman? I don't know what you're talking about, Batwoman. Um, well, okay, so we talked about a couple weeks ago when uh, the big news hit that um, Ruby Rose was not going to be coming back for season two. Um, and all the speculation as to why and, you know, the discussions and everything that came out afterwards, great. Um, one of the biggest things, and I think this is a very interesting decision, the... Uh, Showrunners have decided to kill off the character of Kate Kane, keeping the character of Batwoman, of course, 
but not just having a different actress under the cowl, uh, but doing away with the entire character of Kate Kane and reinventing her as uh, this new, uh, I think so far unnamed uh, person. So very interesting to not just um, start over with a new actress, soap opera style, just sort of like swap out the part of Kate Kane will now be played by, you know, it, it's going to be a completely new person, completely new character. There is no Kate Kane to compete storyline wise or to come back and take up the mantle again um it's it, it's interesting i'm sure it'll i'm sure it'll work I, i'm hoping it works i think it'll be great uh, it'd be very interesting and intriguing and create some new opportunities with storytellings and and uh relationships with the characters but um what do you guys feel about that Because I know, I, Bill, you are so into wanting to talk about it. Yeah, I mean, especially for me who, like, lives and breathes DCU, mm -hmm. I oddly find myself not caring. Um, <laughs> because I think it's the... I, I'm of two minds of this, okay? I think it potentially is the wrong way to go because there is such a familial element to the show with her relationship with her father and with Alice mm -hmm. um, that it just seems that everything they built up in the first season is out the door yeah effectively so and uh on top of that since it was a, a one season show one season show at this point it's a lot less disruptive for recasting than it would be if we were four seasons in yeah um that's just my feel um I think there may be some elements that they could incorporate if they are killing off Kate Kane that may have an effect on her father, um, which could feed into the storyline. Alice as well, um, if if her death is a plot point, like is a plot point that's exploited in a in an interesting and novel manner. Mm -hmm. um, but I have, I oddly don't care. I don't know why. <laughs> um, I, I just i just stopped caring i was so giddy with star girl's fourth episode i think yeah. and then the, this business came in that i was like i don't care i got star girl for another <laughs> nine weeks so <laughs> well and i'm sorry i'm sorry to all the, the kate kane fans i just well, i will oddly that. find myself not caring I, I contrast that to the other big news that came out from the CW's DC. Well, shows let other people does uh, at least Caleb. He loves Kate Kane, so I, I do know I love Kate Kane. I just don't watch. The I don't show. watch any of the C yeah. CW stuff. I saw yeah. maybe the first episode, but I mean, I I just I'm not a TV guy. As much yeah. as I actually, I think the past two weeks I've watched two more t television than I've watched in the past year, and I'm not exaggerating. Uh, just because I, with everything going on in the world, I've kind of got into a funk and couldn't bring myself to read because mm -hmm. nothing I was reading felt important enough to like to uh, pay attention to with what was going on in the world so I've, I've watched a couple of shows but they're not superhero shows I like <sighs> I like my capes and my books like okay that's... okay I just wanted to get your opinion in because I know you have a, a very to... big affinity for the the comic book character oh yeah she's she's top five DC for me like I, I love her I mean I, talking to Jeremy Hahn of, with about her a couple of weeks ago, it, you know, just she's amazing and she's queer representation in comics and she's just mm. a badass and I absolutely love everything about her. I would love to see her in my DC book sometime soon because you've got her on a show but you don't have her in the on the shelf. Yeah, it's interesting how that happens. Uh, it's interesting. <laughs> no, seriously, like, like Supergirl's series yeah. is dying out. The last few issues are digital only. Um, there the publication history for Doom Patrol, while that's mm -hmm. been uh, an ongoing concern, has been spotty to say the least. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no ongoing Swamp Thing series apart from the Walmart Giant. Um, and it's it is just... interesting sometimes that, it, it, and I think it shows like how little correlation there is. Yeah, uh, it's, sometimes it's not just DC meeting. either. Mar Marvel oh, no. does the same thing. Um, when Spider Verse came out, yeah. there was no Miles Morales book out. Uh, you know, yeah. half the movies that come out, yeah. there's nothing related to the comics. Uh, from, We've from had Agents of Shield entered its seventh season, and yeah. in that time, there was a complimentary comic for 14 months yeah. of those seven years. Yep. So, yeah. I don't. It's, get it's it. just strange. It's, yeah. Yeah. <sighs> All right, what was your other bit of news, Steve? 
Well, it, it came along with that. It's like, okay, well, not only are we going to have, you know, story, story-wise, story uh, a challenge uh, in Batwoman um, with the removal of Kate Kane from the stories, uh, more or less, or at least as an actual living character, um, but also Hartley Sawyer, um, who plays oh. Longgate Man um, in The Flash, uh, had some older tweets, of course, you know, that came back and, uh, you know, they were they were offensive and um the showrunners of course given you know not just not just the current environment but also just in general um very much with what's been you know the the case for anybody who does have you know recorded very offensive things being said they had to let him go um and uh you know he did apologize very you know uh very quickly after that um, his other uh, co-stars did, you know, talk about it, did address it, and uh, you know, we were very clear that you know this type of language uh, had no part, um, you know, had no place uh, in their in their family, basically. Um, so there is some kind of uh, speculation on how they're going to uh, write the elongated man out of the show. Um, are they going to remove him completely? Are they going to recast him? You know, especially with removing Kate Kane uh, and killing Kate Kane as a character off uh, once Ruby Rose left, uh, my guess is they're just going to uh, have him out of the show. What that's going to do for some of the things that they've been setting up, especially now that he he was a regular cast member and not just a guest cast member, mm-hmm. setting up the relationship with Sue Dibney, etc. Yeah. Um, you know, first of all, I hate the actress who plays Sue, Sue Dibney. Yeah. I couldn't stand her. Um, I think it's a character that's very easy to jettison. Mm-hmm. in the context that he operates within the show he kind of is a, 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 it's very easy to remove him from the equation you just you pull him back like a rubber band and shoot him in his face yeah, yeah maybe, <laughs> hey, or you maybe just replace it with plastic man and then you're like okay here you go hey maybe there's a thing that kills off kate kane and ralph dibney at the same time Ooh. Mm. the cider cut oh no, no. <laughs> cider cut. So, so i did read uh uh Hartley's uh, comments, like his reaction, yeah. really. and I mean, if you're gonna look at a textbook way to handle one of these situations, he did it the right way compared yeah. to like Stephen Amell with uh, the whole T. Franklin uh, mm-hmm. thing going, uh, mm-hmm. and he did not handle it well. No, no, <laughs> so, no. But you know, with with Hartley, I think if there was a situation where those comments were made where he was 17 or 18 years old, there may have been. A, a little bit of leeway there he was in his mid-20s yeah, yeah, at the time he made those yeah. he was i think even like late 20s at that point um and you know homophobic and racist i thought those uh, those touch on him but jesus christ is sexism yeah, um, yeah it, i mean that that was the the, the like my eyes bulged out it's like people still talk like this <laughs> you know? straight guys maybe I don't, I don't know i guess um, yeah <laughs> but yeah it's you know it's very interesting that they would have you know two big casting removals um Mm -hmm. within a couple weeks of each other now you know obviously for very different reasons and you know very different outcomes i think but um it'd be interesting it's going to be interesting when the shows come back uh what's the what's the consensus now would it be January uh, 2021. January 21. Yeah, that's uh, except for uh, Supergirl and Legends are going to be mid-season replacements. Uh, Supergirl's mid-season status is not because of a ratings issue; it's because of um, Melissa Benoit's pregnancy. Uh, so they're pushing that back to mid-season. And uh, Superman and Lois, The Flash, and mm-hmm. Batwoman are intended to, when they actually do have uh, the actual premiere of the season in Ooh. early january oh um interesting i was also reading about like across the board um writers are learning not to write crowd scenes you know, <laughs> however, <laughs> for for episodic television uh, you know however this you know however this falls and however they get back into production uh you probably won't see crowd scenes for about a year yeah. Lots so, of CG or what, could be CG, yeah, yeah. Uh, old lots of warehouses, crowds. yeah, lots of warehouses, yeah, lots of warehouses, lots of, warehouses. <laughs> lots of dream sequences. No one sequences. will ever know what happened here. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, speaking of Supergirl, uh, this past week, I don't know if anybody heard about Chyler Lee 
uh, who plays um, uh, who plays Kara's sister on there, Alex. Uh, Alex, she uh, came out um, for for Pride Month. She came out uh, mm-hmm. on the post for Pride Month. Um, she is she is married to a to a cisgendered man, um, and uh, she didn't specifically state uh, you know where on the rainbow mm-hmm. she falls, but she is a queer woman, uh, and mm-hmm. she is now officially an out queer woman, um, which. You know, when she did write her post, she referred very, um, very heavily to a storyline in the second season that, to me, you know, was very, was very emotional, um, where Mm -hmm. the character of Alex came out as a lesbian, which Mm -hmm. was, um, you know, which was very heartfelt. I'm I'm glad she was able to to sort of make that connection Mm -hmm. um, and talk about how that made her feel uh, and bring it, bring it to where she is now. Yeah. So. I, I guess it's mandatory for CW actresses because Lily Reinhart from Riverdale also came out as bisexual. Yes. Today. <laughs> so, yes, that's uh, you well, know what? Let me let time. me retract that. Mandatory makes me sound like an asshole. So, um, <laughs> I'm just trying to fun. But you know, in let, let's t- you know, in terms of networks, if there's been mm-hmm. any broadcast network that has celebrated um, LGBTQ issues. Yeah, it's that, yeah. you know, so I mean, there's there really is in terms of in terms of uh, queer TV um, mm-hmm. there, there is before CW and after, yeah. or mm-hmm. maybe more specifically, be, uh, you know, before. Um, uh, oh, geez, what's the dude's name? WB? Uh, no, UP. no, no, no. The producer of everything. Oh, Berlanti. Uh, Guggenheim. Berlanti. Oh, Berlanti. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Berlanti. Yeah. But, you know, and I think um, not just not just uh, empowering and not just uh, bringing visibility through queer characters and queer storylines, but also highlighting and, and um, you know, promoting and featuring queer actors, which, mm-hmm. you know. It, and that was also something I, I thought was good about Batwoman, that they were committed to, um, uh, though they're killing off Kate Kane, they're not killing off the notion uh, that Batwoman is a lesbian. Right. Yeah. So when they are, uh, the, their search is specifically geared toward um, to uh, an LGBT actress. Mm-hmm. So. Want to talk about some comic books? Comics. Okay. Comic. Oh, I don't know. I'm sick of starting with Steve, but Steve's always my lucky, my lucky charm. It's like everything goes well. So is it because I'm magically it. I'm, delicious? Hell with it. I'm just sticking Go with the, sticking him. on my gun. Just rub him. Yeah. <laughs> all right steve what are you reading that you're digging well one of the things that uh that i am reading and i have been reading um not as long as some super fans of this of this author and of the series but uh i've been reading copra by michelle beef and uh copra number six can i just interject there it is yeah. michelle fife fife the pronunciation michelle fife i'm so um, smart <laughs> um this is uh michelle fife's uh copra number six uh, six uh with the image the from the image series which is actually uh ongoing issue number 37 if you've been reading it since the first uh round one um copra series quick interjection is there a legacy numbering on the book uh there is way down in the signature Oh, that is so cool. That's so way that's cool to do that. Yeah. So he, he does make sure that you that you see it, that you know it's there if you know to look for it. Um, but yeah, this one is an oversized issue. It's uh, 56 pages as they advertise right here in the book. Um, for uh, the low low price of $4.99. Uh, the one thing that makes this issue to me something that I could not not talk about was the fact that this is a silent issue. It is told through splash pages. Every issue, every page is another splash page. Uh, and, you know, the art is gorgeous. It's very much, if you like Michelle Fife's art, this is, you know, peak Michelle Fife. The colors are gorgeous. The action is fun. Everything could be a pinup every single page. Uh, if you are looking for original art, I'm sure that you could find something that you would definitely want to hang on your wall. Mr. Caleb. Um, the one thing, though, if you notice about the, and I'm not going to show you every page, but if you notice the shape of the frames or the borders of each page is not a perfect square. There are actually letters in the same, in a block style. 
Um, and I noticed this probably about halfway through the issue. I was like, wait a minute. And I went back and then of course each page is a letter that spells out, um, uh, what was it? It was like uh, Chorazon Annihilate. Um, Chorazon, or uh, sorry, Ochazon, which is the uh, sort of the, um, I'd say uh, fourth world uh, corollaries that uh, Michelle Fifay created. But it's Ochazon Saga, this is the prelude to. So of course the pages spell out Ochazon Annihilate, um, which was very clever, very, very cool. And uh, he actually talks about how he's he's been planning to do a silent issue of this for a very long time. You know, he was really inspired by um, uh, Simonson's Thor number 380. Um, he talks about Batman number 433, um, that all of these were just really great um, inspirations to him. Uh, even if they cheat a little bit, sometimes there might be, you know, a, a one word of dialogue or like maybe a framing sentence or something at the very end of the issue. So it's not 100% silent, but the majority of the action is, is told through just pictures um, and perfect framing and, you know, really creative uh, panels. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he kind of also cheated here. It's not a perfectly silent issue because each page is a letter that spells out a phrase. So it's just, it's very clever. And it, this is one of the reasons why I really uh, love Copra. Um, there are so many characters to keep track of. There's so much history. Uh, if you haven't read the original books and I'm you know, working my way very slowly through the original uh, trades. Um, but uh, you know, if you are looking for something interesting that brings in um, obviously inspiration from Kirby's Fourth World, that brings in inspiration from uh, sort of the, the independent uh, superhero and action comics of the 80s and 90s, um, early Valiant, that kind of thing. Uh, Michelle Fifay's work is, is really exciting. Um, How could you not mention Suicide Squad? Suicide Squad, yes. Yeah. I mean, basically the whole, the whole setup, you know, yeah. uh, in terms of storyline is, is a Suicide <laughs> okay. Squad type, uh, type situation. Um, the other thing too, this is not just, a, it is not just the Oaches on Prelude. It also, um, he returns to some characters that uh, we're in the pre-image series, um, and uh, he, he just does sort of uh, small, a small story in the back called Negative Land, featuring several of his characters and what happened to them after the pages uh, that they were in. Um, and I don't have the exact issue numbers, but from the pre-image uh, series, um, sort of just kind of gives them an interesting, possibly a coda possibly an introduction to you know a possible future storyline uh, where they'll be yeah. back so it's it's really it's a really interesting book uh beautifully designed and un unfortunately made me a little sad because in the back matter he talks about how he's so excited and looking forward to going to the east coast comic con in secaucus and heroes con in charlotte <laughs> um and of course that did that was unable yeah. to happen um, um in terms of sampling copra uh it uh, should be worth mentioning that the first issue of the original Bergen Street comic series is available for free through image on Comixology. And if you want to hold it in your hands, because some people do, there is an image first that's coming out in two months Yeah, with that. So, um, and, and image has actually, you know, they've, they've re-released and republished, yeah. reprinted um, all of the collections that for a while were, were just basically through broken books. Um, they were hard to come by unless you saw him at a comic con, he would always have you know a bunch with him uh, so that you could buy directly from him, which is the way I would have loved to do this. Would have loved to see him this month, uh -huh. next week to go and buy a whole bunch more of these, but unfortunately um, now, but uh, I recommend it. Copra number six, uh, if it interests you, um, the new series starts with a new number one, uh, legacy issuing number, issue number 38. Um, hopefully should come out in the next couple of months or so, depending on how, how the publishing schedule is now. Well, thank you, Steve. Yeah. Okay, Brian, how about you? What you reading? Well, so I don't read a lot these days. I'm kind of dipping back into the old comics, but... Very excited. The uh, X-Men books are ramping back up. 
and I read New uh, New Warriors, New Mutants, uh, number ten, and Excalibur, uh, number ten, I believe. Uh, and let me just complain for a minute, because when this whole thing started with Hickman's uh, amazing House of X and Powers of Ten, I really was excited for X Men in a way that I had not been in so long, and we've talked about this uh, at at length over the last you know year year or whatever that they've been relaunched. However, apart from the X-Men proper, and maybe, probably, let's say Marauders, um, and the occasional Hickman written new, uh, new uh, I keep wanting to say New Warriors, New uh, Mutants, I am quickly getting tired of every other book. <laughs> and I love the people making them, uh, and especially uh, Teeny Howard, who is doing Excalibur and I love Excalibur. So I am very uh, disappointed in not myself, but disappointed in general that I am not a fan of what's happening right now. And I really feel like they've all lost the bubble here and are going off in weird ways that just, I don't, I don't think it ties well into the shared narrative of Krakoa. Um, like I get why Excalibur is doing what it's doing. So basically if you're, you're not familiar with Excalibur. Let me back up a second. I know this is mainly for Bill. So I'm just kidding. I'm just saying that uh, the two books, am I still muted or yeah, you can getting, you hear me? Uh, the two books that I am getting are X-Men and New Mutants. Well, so. and those are, so when Hickman's on New Mutants, it's it's fantastic. It's so brilliant mm -hmm. and we've talked about it. But um, Ed Brisson is the other writer and he, I like his stuff. I, I mean, that's the thing. I like these creators a lot. But uh, anyway, I'll come back to that. We'll put a pin in that, as they say. So, so it's Caliber. If you never read it, back in the day, Chris Claremont, Alan Davis, seminal series, X Men in England and fantasy. Let's just say that, right? Uh, different characters, yeah. The Queen's Wave. Oh, I always got to do this one. Um, but uh, anyway, great series, love it. Warren Ellis contributed down the road. Uh, a lot of great artists and other writers have come through. Great series. Kitty Nightcrawler. Uh, uh, Phoenix, uh, what's her name? Rachel, Rachel Gray, Rachel Gray. Yeah. Oh, I think about that one. Yeah. Captain Britain, Megan, you know, very cool. The new version of it, uh, ties in with that. It does not just use the name, which they've certainly done in the past. Uh, Betsy Braddock, who is, uh, Benjamin Braddock, former Captain Britain's uh, sister, uh, formerly mutant Psylocke. She was this badass ninja. Take her out of the ninja body, put her back in her original body. It's complicated. She's now Captain Britain. And you mix in new characters. So some of the same. You got Night. Uh, Night no, Nightcrawler's not around. Uh, Rogue, Gambit, Richter. Uh, in this episode, or in this episode, this issue, Jean, uh, or not Jean, uh, Rachel Gray and uh, Kitty show up. Uh, so they, they, they keep tying it back. They've, 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 you know, kept the connectivity there. Wasn't Kitty dead? So that's the thing. Oh. Kitty did die in uh, Marauders. Spoilers, by the way. I'm sure she's going to come back. Like, nobody is expecting this to last, you know, years and years and whatever. But this book confused the fuck out of me. Sorry if anyone's listening and the kids are around. Sorry. I get a little salty when I've been having my, uh, my beer here. It, it, this is the uh, men's room, by the way, I'm drinking. Just to plug that in. Um, but yeah, no, she's dead and she shows up and you're thinking, okay, maybe they're just out of sync. Like they've been really good at connecting and keeping like a shared story so much. So at the end of each issue, you see the reading order. You should read it. In. So you're like, huh? Then later on, you realize, oh, we're not doing a dream, but we're doing a reality has changed episode issue. Uh, because Betsy's brother, Jamie Braddock who is now the king of Otherworld, uh, and he his mutant power is to reshape reality. And so basically he has just made him a new reality where it is what it is. Uh, and it sets him against like an authoritarian England that hates mutants. And so there's like some good stuff there. It's not, it's not bad. But what is confusing is it's not clear at the beginning until later in the, in the issue that it's an elseworldy alternate reality. So you're just thinking it's all, what? It's just confusing. And what I have a problem with is this storyline, which no fault of theirs, 
got paused a few months ago. So it's been a few months since we read the last one. And now you're doing this with the ant farm. It's like the, the whole thing combined. It's just not very clear, straightforward and not in a boring way, but just it's not it's not clear storytelling to me. Um, there's a whole thing going on with Apocalypse that's not referenced. So they've kind of shunted that aside. There's other weird little side things that have spun off and they're not really addressed. So it's just a mess. And I wish it wasn't because I love the Excalibur and I love Teeny and I love uh, the X-Men and everything about this. So that's my complaint. Number one. New Mutants, number two, not number two, number 10. Also a mess. Differently and and fine, like they're going off and they're kind of doing this. So, so when Ed's writing it, it's we're going off with a certain set of new mutants and we're exploring these lost mutants that are newfound mutants that we need to claim them, collect them, bring them to Krakoa so they can live out their utopia and all that stuff. Fine. Good. That's, that's very much in keeping with the idea of new mutants and other books. Um, but again, like they took a storyline where this mutant's power is to have night is having nightmares and manifesting them in reality. And so you have this weird effect of that and, the art's a little crazy and you got some other characters being mixed in. So it's just, again, a lot of stuff thrown at you at once. And if you're a casual X-Men fan, not that I am and not that Steve is, but I know Bill, you're a little more casual X-Men, right? It's very um, casual. It's you're, you're a hookup X-Men. I'm, I'm a marquee um, creator on the title. Um, when the marquee <laughs> the creator leaves, I'm gone. That's fair. Caleb, I forgot <laughs> what's your, your X-Men attachment. Yeah. Are you? I Well, I love the X-Men. I'm more of an Avengers guy, but I, I do love the X-Men. Peter, I, I'm a huge Peter David mark, so you give me the old school X-Factor stuff, I'm, I'm giddy. But I have umbrage with what's happening right now. Right, and because originally I just had such high hopes because Hickman is – such a masterful storyteller and a masterful, masterful planner that I thought, oh, he's got a plan. He always has a plan. But yeah. hearing him talk about in interviews, that's not what he's doing. He has a plan no. for his book and he's going <laughs> to like eventually rope this all in and tell some kind of good story. But originally, I think he was trying to be more of like a writer's roomy kind of like, you know, mm -hmm. coordinate and help people. And I don't know if that's just gone sideways or he's just gotten too busy or he just doesn't care because that's the other thing with Hickman. If you notice his stuff, sometimes if he loses interest in a, in a thing he's doing, you know it. Like yeah. it, it takes longer <laughs> yeah. to come out, and or it gets it just gets yeah. So it's happened. But yeah. um, especially well, I think one of the things for the casual X Men fan, and when I say casual X Men fan, I have every X Men book from I think I want to say one thirty seven to the when Claremont dropped off. I mean, it's a pretty healthy run. Uh, um, I think what Hox Pox uh, gave the promise to people like me is the ability to read an issue of X-Men or an X-Men spin-off title without needing Wikipedia. Um, because it's a, it's a remarkably convoluted continuity. Mm -hmm. There's no way around it. People say the DC continuity is impenetrable. Jesus. I mean, you know. It's robust. And they cable had, alone. They you know. had a good stopping point. They had a yeah. good like, reset point. But yeah. what I'm feeling and, and also had, just... they, it had a, a good method of... Um, as you said, reset, but also at the same token, if you came in with all this back knowledge, it still served you as well. Yeah, there was a mechanism that served it's, you as it's well. It's a Grant yeah. Morrison-y thing where you take all of it matters, but we're not going to focus on all of it. We're going to focus on this. And oh, by the way, this is still true. Um, yeah. And it did it great. But anyway, so I don't know. I have not loved these last two. And then a couple before that also were a little eh. Uh, but I, I, it's been a few weeks. So uh, I'm going to keep up. I really do want to see how this all goes. Uh, and these are like the main books I'm buying digitally now uh, that are mm -hmm. that are new release other than maybe random other stuff. So like this is my focus. So you may hear me bitch about this going forward later, you know, but uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, I don't know if you guys uh, anybody else read these yet. Uh, I haven't read those two issues, but, um, you know, I have read uh, The Last Marauders, The Last X-Men, uh, even the Wolverine number two that came out um, mm -hmm. a couple weeks back. I mean, this is. 
it, it's slowly coming back and I'm wondering if that's going to maybe help the stories come back together because we're going to be reading them at the same clip or in the same you know together. I, I don't know but I am seeing that slippage and it's it is a bit frustrating that uh, you know the promise of a very tight storytelling um, uh, you know I, I guess connection um, is starting to fray a bit and I, I don't know if it's like you said if Hickman's getting bored or he just doesn't care um, he just cares about his own stuff and not so much what other people are doing but when you have something that shares not just you know central design but also reading order and just you know a lot of um, the same originating material that basically says everything is going to be connected uh, and then you start throwing in some timing, timey wininess and, and yeah. alternate you know, realities. Stories. I mean, this happened with, realities. when Avengers was being run by Hickman, the same mm -hmm. thing happened. And I think, I think it was Ed, it may have been a different uh, collaborator who was brought in to do Avengers world or Avengers mm -hmm. planet or whatever. And like, that was sort of the predecessor to all this. And that, that you could see Hickman was like putting these things out there and maybe telling some broad strokes and then they would fill in the details, but things over time just kind of got away from the, the point. Of what they were trying to do and that's fine you have to you can't write everything and i'm not asking hickman to yeah write everything. oh yeah but yeah. i just feel like the, the the control or maybe it's the editorial i don't know what it is it's just it's just getting back to the bad habits of the past well it's yeah. just well, like you said what they're doing once again is they they sold us something and what they delivered is something completely different yeah um and it just and yeah they did it with avengers a little bit but with the Avengers for that main storyline leading up to Secret Wars, all you actually needed was Avengers and New Avengers. Like, that's all you actually had to tap into. All that the Avengers World, Avengers United, um, what was it, the Avengers AI. Um, mm -hmm. Like, that stuff was there, but you didn't need it. And still, there was only, like, four books. What are they, up to, like, 11 now yeah. with X-Men? Well, like, I mean, they, they ended Fallen Angels because it was only a, supposed to be a six-issue series, but then they started hellions and now you've also well, got cable and you've got wolverine and you yeah and fallen angels was kudaransky and shouldn't have been made but it, that's i digress um but you like what you delivered was not what you sold and yeah. and even outside of the all the like 97 tangential things even in the x-men series which is amazing i'm not like i'm not besmirching the quality of it the first thing you did is kill off a character which is exactly what you said you weren't going to do like Stop it! Fucking quit. Well, yes and no. But we, we should we should move on. But th there's a whole yeah. host of topics we're going to come back to in the weeks to come about this. So just be ready. Okay. Uh, I just checked because I just it was bugging me. I had to know. Uh, Avengers World started with um, Hickman mm -hmm. uh, and very quickly trans trans uh, transmuted to. Hickman co-writing with Nick Spencer and then Nick Spencer writing. Ah, uh, okay. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> I made a face. I made a face. Uh, just one very quick question for people who are much uh, closer up on uh, the current state of X-Men than I am. Do all the X-Books share the same editor? Uh, Usually, historically, question. yes. Uh, historically, they have, but it's yeah. also that eleven books is a lot of books. So um, they they promoted um, mustache um, Jordan Jordan D White Jordan yeah, they, they promoted the Jordan, ukulele guy yeah mm -hmm. they okay. promoted Jordan D White to like like he's over the X Men office okay. um, and then he's got like junior editors and I, I don't mean that derogatorily their editors yeah. are doing their job but he's got editors underneath him that are working in chunks of books okay um, books are chunks chunks. Chunky. chunks of books all right for our resident chunk caleb uh why don't you tell us about something that you're reading <laughs> um mine will mine will be quick uh so i there is a new publisher out um called awa sorry i'll get in closer i just saw this on comiXology today it's it's good. It Check it out. Um, they are a new publisher, and I believe it's going to be a shared universe. But unlike some the other thing that we just talked about, they're not trying to say, "Hey, you have to pick these up if you want to know what's going on." Um, it's a semi-shared universe. It's got some things going on, but we're going to give you different stories for um, different fan bases. And it, it's 
I, I think it's Straczynski is um, kind of over this. And unfortunately, they um, their two flagship books that they put out right before Corona was a, about an outbreak, number one. And then the other one is called The Resistance. <laughs> so <laughs> lots of things happening. Um, timely. Yeah, very, very timely. timely. Um, uh, and unfortunately, they, they had put out their first issues right when that happened. But this one, I, I just got it, new this week. Um, I think it's called Old Haunts. It is by Rob Williams, Ollie Masters. Uh, let's see, we got Lawrence Campbell and Lee Lowridge doing the art on this book. Really fun, really fun story. Um, you guys know, essentially, just as a setup, it's a mafia story. Uh, you know, with the mafia, what's the old phrase? When you're in, you're in. Um, no one gets to retire from the mafia. But but what if they did? What what does that look like if if people get to retire from the mafia? It's called South Florida. Well, <laughs> um, <laughs> hey, you sign those waivers. You don't get to say where they're at. Oh, uh, <laughs> um, but no. But what what if they did? Especially when when this, the mafiosos are kind of a group, and it's one of those situations where they're literally selling out. They're selling their crime business out to get out of the game. Um, and that sounds great, right? But let's think about the things that you have to do, the life you have to live, and literally the bodies you have to bury when you're a mob boss. And it takes the concept of, does that follow you into retirement? Not only does it weigh on your conscience, but let, let's go even deeper and make it a horror story. Do those literal ghosts chase you down? Um, so you have these three main figures, and they one of them got out a decade ago. He, he was done, uh, but he has to come back into the picture because they're, they're selling their business. Uh, and they, they kind of go out to, to bury the last body, so to speak. And as they're sitting there on the edge of town, they're having this conversation, you know, what do we... You know, what do we do with this? What, what what do we do with this baggage that we carry? But all throughout their career, they've had this, there's kind of a symbolism. They're, like, these are, these are old guys. They're, there's there's something to be said for their, uh, <laughs> their quality of their work. They've taken coins for every person, everybody they've buried. They've taken coins and they've stamped an X into it. And they've put it over the eyes of their victims and they've buried them deep in this hill. Um, and as they're burying the last body, you start to see these things kind of come to life. Uh, and as they're as they're driving home, there's this amazing. Let's see if I can find it real quick. Um, there's this amazing splash page of this bird um, who's got these coins in his eyes, and it's a skeleton type thing. Comes out, and none of these guys know it. They kind of get in their car and they're driving home, and they're talking about how you know one of them doesn't really want to do this because he doesn't know how to retire. The other one is drunk. The other one has already been out, so he doesn't care. And then all of a sudden, this bird flies through their window. Their windshield breaks it. They almost crash. You know, it scares the hell out of them. And they, as they pull over to the side of the road, they're trying to figure out what happens. And all through this, you get this weird tone of mm -hmm. haunting. And and that's kind of where I want to close because I hope you go read this. I'll, I'll close with the book, but uh, it just it lets you know that that they're not getting away with this because as they as they're sitting there next to the wrecked car they look up and there is a figure shrouded cloaked you know ominous cloaked on a on a high rise and um all you can see is the coins in its eyes and it's something that's going to come back and haunt them and the story's going to go from there there's a little bit of backstory there's a little bit of subtext there is a, a a detective who raging alcoholic to the point that she's passed out across her steering steering wheel because she's following one of these guys around and you know they have apparently killed her partner it doesn't really get into that but it plants that seed i'm enticed and and for me to be an enticed with, with a book like this this quick uh from from a publisher that i don't know a lot about and that's kind of brand new this is good work and i would like to see more of it i'm a fan of the art um let me show show some of it off um and i I didn't really figure out why I was a fan of it until as we were talking and it's in the tone of, uh, Oh, I just had the name. And of course I, as soon as I said it, I forgot. Um, it is in the tone of, I hate my brain. Um, <laughs> there is a Jeff Lemire, uh, Andrea Sorrentino, excuse me. Sorry. Deepest apologies. It's kind of got this Andrea Sorrentino, it looks like he took a Polaroid of some real life stuff and then he threw it into a Photoshop thing and arted it, which can 
that's hard to do. That's a verb now. Uh, <laughs> that can come out really bad. You How see, soon ago did you come up with that? <laughs> just, you know, South Mouth, it's a thing. Um, that can be really bad. Uh, you can get some really, really poor art. Um, did I mention Kudaransky? I mentioned Kudaransky. Um, this is actually decent, though. This, this is very, it's not quite Andrea Sorrentino, but it's in that same wheelhouse, and he's doing something very cool with it. Uh, enough, like, like it can, you can see the influence, but it's still, it's, it's beautiful, and it's distracting, and it's, it is, the, the art is haunting, and part of what makes it haunting is, is you can see the glimpse of reality in in the drawing and that is neat because it shines through and it makes you as somebody who's into like the the meta fiction of what comics can do it gives you that taste of the real world and then it glosses it back over into the fiction and i think that's something you know you, you don't get outside of the, the medium of comics and so check it out um again it's called old haunts uh, fun retirement story <laughs> okay so, cool I, I I totally I second that for sure. I've read the first two issues, and um, it's it is absolutely uh, fascinating. And one of the good things, and this is actually you know a, a shout out to the publisher, mm -hmm. AWA puts out a um, instead of like a previews uh, magazine, what they do is Upshot Now, and in it um, they actually have full issues of a couple of their featured titles. Um, it's all in black and white. There's no color pages in, in the interior. So it gives it even more indie, you know, cool indie feel. Um, but they'll have full issues of a couple of their series that they want to feature. Um, and then they'll have previews, like usually about seven to nine issue, uh, nine page previews of titles that are also coming up. Mm -hmm. And um, this also comes out monthly. So if you aren't buying all of the regular books, um, you know, this is a good taste. It also gives you an opportunity because they're only, I mean, they're five dollars, um, and you get it. You get two full issues in there, plus you get you know a whole bunch of previews. So it's it's kind of like a you know like a DC giant, underpage giant, basically. Um, that also kind of sounds like a lot cross. Of that also kind of sounds like cross gen edge or cross. Mm -hmm. gen, remember when they would do that? Yeah. Would have like the current issues? Yeah. And uh, it, it's it's great. It's not even not even current issues. I mean, you're getting like the issues in advance because I've I've already read issue two of the haunt and that's uh, of uh, of old haunts and that's not uh, out I think until next month. So, mm -hmm. um, but they also have interviews. They have other things in there. It's a, it's a great resource to tease you about some other books and get you interested in some other ones. So, um, you know, old haunts for sure. Uh, but if you're not sure and you want to see what else they have, upshot now. Uh, okay. Just tagging into that, they have a book called Red Border that's really good. There's also a mm -hmm. book called Hotel um, that, Hotel. that's fantastic. So, yeah, it, it's a cool new publisher. Check them out. Yeah, yeah. no trades yet though. The the books are still still new, still, still brand new. Yeah. So okay, I think cool. The second issues are all that have actually been mm -hmm. been published. Okay, I'm gonna speed through my recommendation because it's getting a little late. Um, I've felt a, a duty to spotlight a DC book since I haven't spotlighted a DC book in some time. Um, and in my catch up pre DCBS box, I was going through the young adult <laughs> original graphic novels that we were talking about. And this one was a, a, an unexpected joy and that's the Oracle Code. Uh, it is written, and I'm going to butcher this name, Marienke Nijkamp. Um, she's Dutch. Uh, and the illustrator is Manuel uh, Pretano. And this basically is a, a version of Barbara Gordon that never gets to be Batgirl. Uh, it's a way of moving her from Barbara Gordon, the teenager, to Oracle, and effectively the same way of her uh, entering the the ranks of the of the differently abled community without as dark a turn as killing joke provides or as mature a turn as killing joke provides um she's a hacker and through an incident um she she becomes paralyzed and and wheelchair bound uh she comes to uh, unfortunately because of uh, Jim Gordon's occupation and his inability to uh, provide for her in the way that he wants to, uh, she goes to the Arkham Center of Independence, 
and uh, this is a version of Arkham Asylum that is geared towards uh, teenagers who've been through tremendous trauma or now uh, are uh, disabled or differently abled in some capacity. But there's a mystery there. And uh, uh, it introduces a nice group of supporting characters that I wouldn't mind seeing again. Uh, it really is almost that it's just James and Barbara Gordon and the and the rest of the touch points are um, completely original as far as I know. If if they are based on DC characters, I don't know them, and if I don't know them, you know, I don't think as many laymen will know them. Um, really, uh, really good stuff here. Um, again, we have to speed through it. I'll give you some uh some looks at the art there so definitely um uh somebody who's you know been used to lumberjanes or material like that there's a there's a lot of uh a continuity in terms of the art style and uh you know with these books it, it's been really nice to see these alternate takes just apart from you know the young adult element or, and I think Steve, you commented earlier about an all ages element, literally all ages can enjoy this. Um, but also the conceit of these remixed versions of the characters we know. I, I think that's a good way of putting it. Uh, and plus, uh, you know, seeing a character who's destined to be a crime fighter, who because of the age that something happened, bypasses the step that you normally associate with the character. And again, uh, you know, especially in terms of uh, the way that uh, children who have been through severe traumas are portrayed in this book, I think um, uh, there's, a, there's a lot there to recommend that. So uh, if you can pick it up, I would suggest that, The Oracle Code. Cool. Yeah. Is that one you've picked up, Steve, or is that? Not yet, not yet. I'm, uh, I'm still working through, um, I picked up Mira. Um, I showed it earlier the uh mm -hmm. the tiebreaker book uh mm -hmm. and then i also have the black canary uh the ignite black canary yeah one, ignite which yeah. you know um i think there's also a sequel planned for that uh coming out pretty soon as well mm -hmm. another black canary uh, okay. book in that series so. all right well it's getting late here as i said and when we wrap an episode of the comic book bears up we do so with a segment we call the wolves of the week segment where we spotlight something, be it a comic book or a film or a television series or a charitable initiative, anything under the sun that we think you, fair listener or viewer, may be interested in sampling. Uh, we'll just, I'm going to start, you know, I'm, I'm as close to clockwise as possible uh, from my view. So that means, Brian, you're actually starting this week. What's your Wolf of the Week? So I have become uh, a fan of this, this YouTube series uh, called uh, Matt Bomb's Queer Culture Cruise. If any of you, uh, Steve, I see you nodding. Uh, this guy, uh, Matt, is a Seattle resident, and uh, my boyfriend Brandon told me about him and had me watch a couple of his. What I love is it's a lot of queer content from television, uh, but not exclusively from my formative years, uh, late 70s into early 80s and mid 80s and on. And it touched stones on different things throughout queer culture and first moments for this and that and how they have like echoed in the future going forward. And so the last one I watched was uh, Madeline Kahn. It's Madeline uh, sitcom that did not last very long, uh, but featured a uh, drag queen character. Uh, and was probably, I think they said it was the first uh, to, to do so. Uh, and uh, which does, kind of, anyway. But it also echoed back uh, up to more recent times when they had Jinx Monsoon and other performers performing in those kind of roles. So great. I'm not doing it justice. Matt Bomb is very entertaining. The queer culture cruise part is kind of a funny gimmick. But you know what? It works. It actually makes it a little more visually appealing uh, to see him in his little sailor outfit with his hat. Uh, he's, he's also got a nice little beard, so he's cute. Uh, that does not help or does not hurt. Certainly helps. Um, so yeah, Matt bombs, queer culture cruise on YouTube. Go check it out. All right, cool. Over to Steve. Steve, what is your wolf of the week? Um, I've got another TV show, of course, like I always do. Um, this one is, uh, very interesting. If you have been a fan of the show chewing gum, 
um, or uh, a couple other things that the writer and main actress in that series, Michaela Cole, has done. Um, she's a really fascinating actress. I love her stuff. Um, you know, uh, she's done a lot more in the UK uh, that may not be available here, but one that is that just came out on HBO is called I May Destroy You. And uh, basically, she is a writer. Um, the first issue, the first episode opens on her coming uh, back from basically a couple weeks of a writer's retreat. She's been going back and forth to Italy, where she's been hooking up with a gentleman that she may or may not have a relationship with. Um, and it just kind of gets you really into her world. The, um, the setup is that she may not really be done with the second novel that she's supposed to be writing. She's considered the voice of the generation and, of course, now is hitting that sophomore slump. Um, and uh, her publishers and editor uh, are very um, eager for her to finish that book and to provide it uh, as soon as possible because of the advance and all the time that she's taken in Italy and all the enjoyment that she's been having. Um, and through the course of the first episode, she struggles with her procrastination, her real, you know, her kind of malaise in trying to finish this book. And just, of course, the, the usual confusion that happens in an early 20s uh, person's life. Uh, and then something really tragic happens. Um, and uh, even though there is a lot of humor in this, there is something, um, you know, that happens that really does change, maybe not the direction of the show, but changes the, the feel of the show um, and can very, I think, can be a, a good shock in something like this that brings it into a lot more realism than maybe you know, we could have been expecting having seen things like Chewing Gum and, and other shows that she's done. But um, I really recommend it. She is fascinating to see. The supporting cast is wonderful. Um, and uh, I May Destroy You. It is on HBO, I believe, on Sunday nights is when they release it. Um, or if you have HBO Max, it'll be streaming on that as well. Hey, cool. Over to Caleb. Caleb, what is your Wolf of the Week? My Wolf of the Week goes to a comic. Um get to talk about them now they're, they're out again um so my favorite series of last year was a book called faithless um and it was written by brian azarello and it was drawn by an artist that has completely captivated me ever since i saw uh her first on faithless but she also does these graphic novels and her name is maria lovett uh and she does one called loud that's that's amazing but this week and i purposely didn't talk about it even though i wanted to because it's brand new and i don't want to spoil it for anybody Faithless 2 come, came out. Um, I'm incredibly excited. I've already read it. It's everything I wanted it to be. The book is is hyper queer uh, from a feminine perspective. It's about art. It's about Satan. Um, it's about um, <laughs> witchcraft and breaking the rules and being taboo and bringing that taboo to the mainstream. It's about nightmares and reality. It, it's it's so good. Um and it's not for the faint of heart. Uh, it is, it's not, it, it is pornographic, but it is not smut, if that makes sense. The book does not shy away from, from queer sex, um, and all of that, all of its forms. Uh, but it is not smut. It is not taking advantage of it. And I appreciate that. Uh, it, I was worried about that at first, but yeah, go check out, check out Faithless Volume 1. Um, fall in love with Maria Lovett the same way I did and then pick up Faithless 2. Okay, awesome. My Wolf of the Week goes out to a comic book sale. Uh, though it hasn't really been uh, at the forefront, this still is Pride Month. And on Comixology, there are a number of Pride sales. Uh, Fanagraphics has their own Pride sale. Boom has their own Pride sale. And uh, somebody else, uh, Oni has their own pride sale, but there also is a small press pride sale. And if you go to that section on the sales, on, on the sales uh, portal on Comixology, you'll see a lot of people that were guests on this show and who are friends of ours. Uh, so if you go there, uh, you can pick up material like uh, Shirtlifter by Steve McIsaac is on sale. Oh, Human Star by Lou Delaquanti, Bludgeon by Jeremy Owen. Uh, Dash by Dave Ebersol. Uh, just apart from Dash itself, there's a lot of uh, material that's from Northwest Press. 
uh, from Zan Christensen is on there. Um, Al Qaeda super secret <laughs> super secret weapon is on there that we talked about uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, Steve had brought up the uh, Eins anthology. There's another horror anthology that's uh, spearheaded by our friend Justin Hall, The Theater of Terror. And also some other books of people who haven't been on the show, but the, some of us have relationships with, uh, like the Finn and Charlie books by Tony Breed, the Jason material uh, recollected uh, from Jeff Krell. Uh, so a lot of great content there at really good prices. I did say Bludgeon by Jeremy Owen, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. good. <laughs> I want to make sure I got that in. Uh, so uh, check that out. Uh, really amazing prices, really amazing material. That's my Wolf of the Week. All right. Wrapping this one up in a nice bow. Again, we are the Comic Book Bears podcast. You can find us on the Twitter and the Tumblr and the Instagram as Comic Book Bears. You can find us on the Facebook as Comic Book Bears podcast. If you want to listen to us, you can do so by listening to us through iTunes, by downloading us or listening to us through Stitcher Radio or some of the other podcasting platforms. If you want to write to us, you can do so by sending an email to comicbookbears at gmail.com. And as you see here, we've attempted the uh, Facebook Live. It seems we have worked out the kinks. It's lost on everybody else, but if you were here earlier, you'd understand and they hate me now. Uh, but uh, thank you for joining us. If you did join us for the uh, live component, uh, this will also be up on YouTube. Uh, if you're enjoying us through that, please let us know. And if you are listening to us through iTunes, please write a review. And we will be back next week. So until then, I'm Billy Z. I'm Brian Pittard. I'm Steve Morey. And I'm Caleb Alexander McKenzie. You're going to hear a woof and an explosion. We'll be back next week. Take care, everyone.